You turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, uh, chapter 14. Luke, chapter 14. This morning, we want to talk about the rejected invitation. Uh, the rejected invitation. We're going to, again, not get through all of this. And um, we'll see where the Lord will uh, take us this morning. But we're not going to... Uh, trying to get through all of it. You know, as I've been going through Christ's object lessons and looking at these particular parables, um, we could not, in this capacity, uh, exhaust the ideas that are introduced to us as we look at these various chapters and Christ's object lessons. You know, if you, you, you combine um, Desire of Ages, Ministry of Healing, uh, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, the book Education, Steps to Christ. Um, if you combine them together, you get um, uh, an education in the work of Christ. You could take Steps to Christ, Christ's Object Lessons, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, Ministry of Healing. Um, did I say Steps to Christ? I said Steps to Christ. Uh, the book Education. You take these five books and you read them, but then you take the book Desire of Ages and you actually see how to put it into practice. You actually see how Christ put all of these various chapters and this, this experience that you're reading about, you see exactly how Christ put it into practice. It's one thing for someone to give you a manual or an instruction book when you can't read. You have an manual, but you can't read. You can't really understand it. And so through the operation of the Holy Spirit, through the example that we see and understand, God actually shows us how to, if, I, if we could sum it up, how to put on charity, how to put on the garments of praise, the robe of righteousness. We see this in the life of Jesus. And so as Christ has given these particular parables, it's he is endeavoring to save his people. Yes he's, yes, he's showing them how far they have drifted away from Christ. We are told in the book Desire of Ages that, that, that the, the demons that had possessed men, the very stamp of these lesions were upon their faces. This was a common occurrence to come across uh, the people of God in this deplorable condition that they had fallen into and yet they were still desiring that God would send them the deliverer. They were still singing the hymns as it were. They were still looking for, forward to the coming of Jesus. They were still, well I wouldn't say Jesus, but they were looking for a deliverer mm -hmm. of some sort. And, and while they were, uh, 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 they had, we are told they had enshrined upon their homes, as it were, the, the, the hymns and the praises, and they were looking for the coming of Christ. And yet we are told when he came unto his own, they received him not. They were anticipating it because their deliverance they were looking for was not deliverance from sin, but deliverance from oppression. And we today could even preach prophecy not with a sense of helping people to understand the urgency to draw near to Christ, but the urgency to run from the powers of the earth. And we are more desirous to be, uh, uh, as it were, in the country. We're more desirous to, to, uh, 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 to see the Sunday law coming. We're more desirous to see the fulfillment of prophecy, not because it's going to draw us closer to Christ, but just so that we can say we're right. Because all of these things that God has given to us are a means by which the greatest thing could be accomplished because should Christ come and his people are not ready, then that would not be an excitement for Christ. He's coming back for his people. He wills that we be with him where he is. 
And so this is why Peter says it is not only given to us to know the time, but also that we can hasten the time. And again, inspiration says that when the what? Character of Christ is what? Perfectly reproduced. What does that mean? It says later in the same in the same book, Christ's Object Lessons, page 384, that when our, that when the desire to bless others springs forth spontaneously, then we know that our characters are complete. When there's a spontaneous desire to see a problem and fix it, when there's a spontaneous desire to see someone that you can see that's in a lost condition and wanting to know Christ, you can go to them. When that is accomplished, then character perfection is accomplished. Then Jesus can come back to save us as his own. And so here when we look in Luke 14, and as Jesus recites this parable of the rejected invitation, we must understand and ask God to give us grace that we might be able to enter into this, into the feelings of God to see how he felt even saying that his, re his invitation uh, was being rejected by his people. How would you feel if you sent out invitations and people literally made excuses that you saw were no excuse not to come? This is how Christ felt even while uttering this parable. His heart was, was pain to know that his children that he wanted to use to, to, to be an example to the world was rejecting his invitation. And the Bible tells us here in Luke 14, verse 15, well, verse 16, Jesus says, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, do what? Come, for all things are now ready. There's a, there's a similar invitation that is given in Matthew 22. If you look in Matthew 22, I believe it's verses 1 to 14, Matthew 22, there's a similar invitation that is given. And this invitation in Matthew 22, as well as here in Luke 14, they are both rejected. The one in Matthew 22 shows us that is not enough just to accept an invitation to come to church. It's not enough just for us to make a profession of holiness. It's not enough for us to just profess with our mouths that we're God's people, but there has to be a fitness. There has to be a fitness in order to sit with God at his table because you remember last week, the verse prior to this, verse 15, when Jesus was talking about who they should not, not necessarily should not, he says, but when you make a feast, don't call people that you're familiar with. Don't call those who can, who can, who can repay you. Call those who can't and you will be repaid in the resurrection. Go to those who are in the prisons. Go to the poor and the, 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 the ragged beggar. Go to those who would never come to church because of the way they look or their occupation. I told you I was in California. We were out working the streets. And all of a sudden we, we worked in what they call a red light district. And we had come across a young lady and we began to, and I just wasn't paying attention. And we just stopped and started talking and she immediately started crying. And as she started crying, I began to realize like, oh, wow, I'm, I, I realize where I'm at now. And all of a sudden she says, please, she says, you know, pray for me. And she says, forgive me. And I'm sitting there. This is my first time being out and I'm talking with her. And all of a sudden she began to cry and I didn't know what to say. So I'm standing there. She said, please forgive me. Please, please forgive me. She said, I'm only doing this because I have to save. I have to take care of my children. I, I don't have any other way to take care. And, and I mean, tears are flowing down our eyes. And she says, please pray for me. I don't want to be out here. But and she's crying and she's crying profusely. And I'm standing there. And these are individuals who would never come into the church because of their lifestyles. These are individuals that when the, there, there was a tent pitched in that district. And they would come past the tent not to come in, but they will wait outside just to put their offerings in. 
they would wait for the offering bucket to come and they would actually call the usher outside of the tent and they said, I can't come in. I just want to be able to give something to the cause. And every night they would come because again, they didn't feel right. They didn't, they didn't feel as though they would be accepted in the reality, brothers and sisters, a lot of them wouldn't be. A lot of them wouldn't be accepted. And a lot of people, believe it or not, are being saved outside the church. A lot of people, brothers and sisters, are giving their hearts to Christ outside of the church. And God is not bringing them to the church for fear of how they would be treated. Can you imagine the publican, how he felt being in the temple and here's a pastor standing next to him and the pastor is saying, Lord, I am grateful that I'm not like this man. How must that publican, no wonder he couldn't look up. He probably came believing like, wow, you know, I met that man, Jesus, and, and, and man, I heard that message and he made me feel as though that God would accept me. And I listened to this message of repentance and I'm seeing like, wow, God really does love me and it's not too late. And he goes to the church thinking that he's going to encounter the same people that was like Jesus. He, he had probably thought that, man, there's probably going to be other people at the church like this man, Jesus that I had met, but only to get there and to hear him being ridiculed. And he couldn't look up and he had to hold his head down and just say, Father, I, I'm probably worse than what this man says. He probably doesn't even know half of what's going on in my life. Have mercy upon me. And Jesus says, this man went home justified more than the other. And so there are individuals that are heeding the invitation, but many of them are coming to the church like the thief on the right side of Jesus who heard the message, who accepted it, but when he came to the temple, he was discouraged. And he plunged into a life of sin to drown out the conviction, only to allow the circumstances of life to place him in the greatest place that he could ever been placed in, right next to God. His circumstances, the woman caught in adultery. Matter of fact, the woman who was set up to commit adultery was again in her lifestyle, but circumstances brought her to the greatest position that she could ever be placed. Amen. There she was at the feet of Jesus. Circumstances of life brought her there. And brothers and sisters, one thing that you and I must be very careful of, that we do not allow ourselves to be scaffolds in this great work. Because every building needs a scaffold, right? It, 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 it makes life easy for the workers. And you and I could be scaffolds. We can be donating money. We could be uh, giving things to the cause. We could be praying for other people. We could be handing out tracts and yet never be a part of the process. Not allowing the actual spirit of God to work in our lives. But we're doing everything we can because we think that by our service, we're going to be saved. And so our service becomes our religion. And we look at our service as our savior. And others are being blessed by us, but we ourselves are not being filled with the Spirit of God. Because when Jesus sent out the 12, Judas was among them. But the Bible says God knew from the beginning that he would betray him. And yet Judas had the, oppor the opportunity and the privilege of seeing the Spirit of God work in others. Seeing the Spirit of God heal people, seeing others being raised from the dead. He had the privilege of being that close, brothers and sisters, to God, and yet did not allow the Spirit of God to bring a change in his own experience. He was a scaffold. And brothers and sisters, when the grand opening comes, you don't see the scaffolds, do you? They're moved out of the way. God doesn't want us to be scaffolds. God has called us to be living stones. Amen. God wants us to be a part of the building. In order to be a part of the building, we must allow the word to chisel away the rough spots. We must allow the word of God to fit us 
where we are because as the building is going up, as it did in the days of Solomon, we understood that there was not a hammer, there was not a chisel heard, it was a silent work. The building was coming together without any fanfare, but it was going up slowly and quietly. But it was finished. And what we're looking for is this great manifestation of something, but oh, brothers and sisters, the work is going forth steadily, continuously, and silently. And when we look up, and when we see the great movings of God, we're going to wonder why we're not a part of it. But we have not been allowing the chiseling to take place in our experience every single day of our lives. The Bible tells us here in Luke 14, God made a great supper and he sent out his servants and his servants were saying that all things are now ready. This was an invitation. Notice what your Bible says in the book of, let's go to, hold your finger there. Or if you have something, go to Isaiah 55. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 55. And we want to look at verse one and two. This is the invitation that God has given, not just to the world, but believe it or not, the invitation is coming to those of us who are sitting in the pew. Because when John the Baptist came preaching, the Bible says not all of the Gentiles, but it says all that were in Jerusalem came out and Judea, they came out to hear the prophet. Amen. God was, John the Baptist had brought to them the message and they were to give heed to the message and they were to recognize their condition. But again, like in the days of John, they did not feel that this message was for them. They felt that they were, they were above the ABCs of spirituality. This was not speaking concerning them. And this is why John says, say not within yourselves. We have 1844 to our fathers. Say not within yourselves that you are the children of prophecy. Say not within yourselves, you know who Ellen White is, you know who James White and, and Loughborough and Jan Law, uh, 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 Jan Loughborough. Say not within yourselves that these men are part of your inheritance, but unless you bring forth fruit, meet for repentance. God is going to raise up those that are going to fulfill the position and the place that he has designated you to. Because it is not the profession that saves us. It is the fruit that we bear is evidence of our connection to the true vine. Not a profession of our faith. Not being able to look and see who are the ancestors of this great awakening that God has brought to the world but it is our fitness and our in and, and it is our connection to the true vine we have to be grafted in brothers and sisters because we're that wild olive plant amen we have to be grafted into the vine each of us individually it does not serve that my mother or my father and that i was born into the church i'm not born into christ I have to be born again. Notice what it says, Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, looking at verse one and two, when you have it, amen. The Bible says, Ho, oh, everyone that what? Thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye buy, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread and you labor for that which satisfieth not hearken diligently unto me and eat that which is good and let your soul do what delight itself in here. The Bible says God says, ho everyone that thirsteth, ho everyone that thirsteth. Go in your Bibles to the book of Revelation 22, Revelation chapter 22 and let's look at verse 17 revelation 22 verse 17 the bible says ho everyone that what thirsteth ho everyone that thirsteth 
This invitation is for those that are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. God sees that the Spirit of God is moving as it was in the beginning of creation. The Bible says that the earth was without form and it was dark and that darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God did what? Move upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light. The Spirit of God is pulling, is grabbing, is tugging at our hearts. And God sees, and now the Spirit of God, and the, through God's messengers and through His servants, they send out the call to say, He that thirsteth, come to the waters. Why are you struggling and living for that which satisfieth not? Turn from the world and grab hold of Jesus. But you say, well, wait a minute, preacher, I'm already in the church. No, many of us are in the church, but we are still facing the world. The world still plays a, have a large part in our lives. And God is trying to bring us to the point where we recognize that there is nothing in this world that is going to meet and satisfy the hungering and the longing of the soul. Just like when God met the woman at the well, Jesus says, hey, give me water. You don't have a bucket. If you knew who it was that it was asking you, you would have asked him and he would have given you that living water. Her whole life flashing before her eyes. Give me this water. And Jesus says, go and get your husband. Because Jesus was trying to show her that the life she was living and what she was after would never satisfy what Christ can do. It will never fill the void in your life. What you are, what you're clamoring for, what you are uh, 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 um, rejecting the Spirit of God over it will never satisfy. Notice what it says, Revelation 22. Revelation 22 and verse 17. And the Spirit, are we there? And the Spirit and the bride say what? Come and let him that heareth say what? Come and let him that is a thirst do what? And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Notice what it says, 2 Corinthians now, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, the Bible says, let him that heareth say what? Come, meaning that when you receive the invitation yourself, God grants you his spirit and that same invitation that was given to you is now seen in, in you giving it to others. We are told in Desire of Ages 141 that no sooner are we converted, that there is born within our hearts a desire to make known to others. What a friend we have found in Jesus. We see from the life of the disciples when John says, Behold the Lamb of God. And the disciples followed Jesus and said, Lord, Rabbi, Master, where dwellest thou? Come and see. They came, they saw, they left, and they began to invite others. Come see a man. We have found the Messiah. And this is how, brothers and sisters, that invitation is awakened in us when we go and see exactly where Christ dwells. When we have that desire to enter into that secret place with God. When we come and kneel before the Lord with our Bibles open and we ask God to speak to us. Lord, draw me closer to thyself. I have heard what it has been said about thee, but Lord, I must see thee for myself. And as we have that desire to draw into God's presence, the Spirit of God, as he begins to fill our hearts, then that invitation that we have received, it is too much for one man to, to accept, and we start giving the invitation to others. We start inviting them to know the friend that we have come to know. We want them to experience the freedom that we have experienced. I, someone called me the other day from one of the most likely places that I think anyone would get a phone call these days. I'll leave it right there. And they called me and I said, hello. And they said, yes. And they called my name and I said, wow, this is something. And we began to talk 
And as we were going through the conversation, he says, you know, he said the last time we talked, which probably was about 10 years ago. He said, the matter of fact, it was a little longer than that. He said, the last time we talked, he said, I heard your voice, but I just didn't hear your words. He said, now I'm hearing you and I'm hearing what you're saying. And he began to tell me what God has done in his life. He says, you know, the last time we talked, he says, you called me the next day. And I remember vaguely calling. He said, and you left to answer. He said, you left something on my voicemail. He said, you left Psalms 23 on my voicemail. And he said he hung up and the next day he got himself in trouble. And he said, when the trouble came, he just said, Lord, you were preparing me for this. And he went into what he calls his valley of the shadow of death. And he says, and now he says, I have found Christ. And he says, you know, you know, he will talk about different things because, I, you know, we grew up together. And he says, you know, the things that we used to learn as a kid he said, I've always heard it. And he says, people have always come with the Bible and they've always tried to tell me. He said, but I got to the point where I said, if I'm going to believe in this, he said, I need to know it for myself. I need to know it for myself. And he, he said, and I, I, I got a correspondence course and I've, and, I've, and I've got a certificate. And he said, and I've learned to understand the scriptures. And so as we were conversating, and I'm hearing them call him quoting scriptures and it was just natural. It was it wasn't like they were trying. It was just a natural outflow of this. And I'm sitting there listening and I'm saying, wow, this 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 brother has come to trust in Jesus. And I'm just I'm 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 awed by in that span of time. Not so much what God is able to do is just sometimes, brothers and sisters, we tend to doubt and not believe that God can do what he says he can do. We pray for people often and yet sometimes don't believe that God is going to do anything with those prayers. You know, the saying is, if you're going to worry, why pray? But if you're going to pray, why worry about it? But oftentimes we're praying for things that sometimes like little children, we don't want. You know, your children come in and they ask for something. If you just give them a couple of minutes, they'll get distracted and go to some, something else. And so you'll be able to determine if this is a serious asking or if you're just asking because you see it. And a lot of times, brothers and sisters, like our Heavenly Father, we are asking for things. And it's not that God doesn't want to give it to us. God simply provides an experience so that we can begin to hunger for what we're asking for. That we can have a real desire to obtain the blessings that he wants to give to us. And many times we are wondering, why am I not having the experience that I should be having? It's because we're not going to Jesus to get it. We're going to others and we're saying, please open this book for me. And we're going and saying, man, can you teach me? But the reality is God says, I've given my Holy Spirit. He will guide you into all truth. And what we are to do is to point them to who can answer all the questions that they have. Every problem in your life, you must learn to communicate with Jesus because he can answer the problem. Notice what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because when we talk about the servants being sent out, the servants, brothers and sisters, represent those of us who recognize that all things are now ready. Those of us who are first partakers of the, of the heavenly calling, those of us who recognize the call of God upon our own lives, and we in turn give the invitation because it says, he that, it says, he that heareth, come. No, no, what does it say? We just read it. Revelation twenty two seventeen. 17. Um, what does it say? Revelation twenty two seventeen. 17. Let him. All right. Start at the beginning. What does it say? And the spirit and thank you. And the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that heareth say, come. So those of us, the spirit and the bride is calling us. And when we hear the invitation and respond to it, we then turn and say, what? Come. What did the woman at the well do? 
when she left Jesus. She went and got what? The whole city. What did she say? Come see a man that has told me everything. You must understand the compellingness that she had in her and the light that they saw in her that would cause them to leave what they were doing and go sit with Jesus for three days. And then to sit there and say, you know what? Now we believe. Not because of what you said, but because we have heard him want for ourselves. And that has to be our experience today. We have to know where we are, brothers and sisters, because we have heard him for ourselves. I understand what you have said and I believe what I'm hearing, but the reality of it is I am only going to be able to defend what I really know. And we have to know Jesus for ourselves because people are going to look at us and people are going to ask and they are going to see in our voice and hear in our voice and see in our eyes whether or not we really believe what we're saying. People know the professions we're making and guess what? They're watching us. And by beholding, they are, brothers and sisters, being changed. The Bible says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, looking at verse 20, it says, I'll start at verse 19, to wit, God was in Christ doing what? Reconciling the world. Pardon me. God was in, to wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Now, you, we know what that word imputing means, right? <coughs> imputing means is something that is being credited towards you. Something that God says, you know what? It's, 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 this has been credited against your account. God was not imputing, it says, God was not imputing their trespasses unto them <clears throat> and hath, notice this, <clears throat> pardon me, and have committed unto us the what? The word of reconciliation. Verse 20. Now then, we are what? Ambassadors, messengers, forerunners, representatives of heaven. All because, don't forget, I didn't read it, but put in your notes, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. And now, brothers and sisters, that God has transformed the life. Now that we have responded to the invitation, <clears throat> God makes us his ambassadors, his forerunners. And now when we move throughout the earth, we are speaking on God's behalf to individuals. And what they do not receive of us, God says in the resurrection, as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. So it says, now then are we ambassadors for Christ <clears throat> as though God did what? Beseech you by us. We pray you in God's stead, do what? Be ye reconciled to God. Verse 21, for he hath made him to be what? Sin for, Sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made what? righteousness of God in him. So now this is what God is calling for us as ambassadors. We're beseeching them to be reconciled to God. Why? Because Christ has been made sin for us. Who knew no sin. But yet Christ felt every aspect of our sins. Christ felt the weight of our sins. And now God is asking, says now, just as he was made to be sin for us, God wants us to make us the righteousness of God by faith. A faith that takes on a living, tangible experience. Not just imaginary, but a reality that you can know what? That I belong to God. Could Stephen have an imaginary religion while he was being stoned? No, brothers and sisters. Stephen knew who God was. 
And the Spirit of God was so much manifest in his life that what did he say? Lord, don't lay this sin to their charge. That was the Spirit of Christ. That was the character of Christ being perfected. So now, brothers and sisters, let's go back here to Luke. Luke, I told you we wasn't going to get through this, but notice what it says. Here we go back to Luke, and we look at Luke 14, and we want to look at verse 18. Luke 14, and we want to look at verse 18. And the Bible says, and they, the invitation has gone out, and they with all, and they all with one cons consent began to do what? make excuses. They with all with one consent began to make excuses. And then he begins to list the various excuses that was put forth as a reason why they couldn't come. Now, if they with one consent have made an excuse, then what they are saying is just a part of what they have already agreed to. We're not coming. We're not going to respond. And so when one is asked individually, he starts coming up with an excuse of why he can't come, but he had already determined that he was not going to go. The Bible tells us in the book of John, matter of fact, let's go there, John chapter 7. John chapter 7. John chapter 7. And we end on this, this thought here. John 7 and I want us to notice what the Bible tells us here. John chapter 7. This is the Feast of Tabernacles. <clears throat> Excuse me. This, if, as Pastor Siegel said in Sabbath school, this is the end. Right before the Feast of Tabernacle, you have what feast? Day. Day of Atonement. And here they are on the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus doesn't come to the feast at the beginning. Jesus comes in the midst of the feast. When Jesus comes to the feast, he looks at the people and he said, all you who are thirsting, come to me. If you're really desiring something, he says, come to me. In the midst of their feast. And the people began to draw near to Jesus. And he begins to speak to them. But then all of a sudden, the, the leaders in the church, the leaders over the nation, they sent out the police to go and get him. They said, hey, go, go. This man is mad. The whole world is going after him. Go and get him. And they come back with this response. Notice what it says in verse 45 of John 7. Then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said unto them, why have you not brought him? Verse 46, the officers answered what? They went to get Jesus and they heard him speaking and they're now these are soldiers. Yes. These are men of rank, whatever they have gone through to get to this point in their service. They are somewhat hardened by the realities of crime and the things that they have had to deal with. And yet when they heard Jesus speaking, the only thing they could say is never man speak like this man. These rough men are moved. Now notice how the leaders respond. The Bible says in, in verse 46, uh, they never man spake. Verse 47, then answered them, the Pharisees, are you what? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees done what? Believed on him. But this people, those who are following him, who knoweth not the law are what? Cursed. These men had conspired already that they are not going to receive the message that Christ is bringing to them. You read in John chapter 12 where it said, matter of fact, go there, John. Go to John chapter 12. Go to John uh, chapter 12 and let's jump over to verse 40. 
John chapter 12. Matter of fact, let's look at verse 37. John chapter 12, let's look at verse 37. Watch what the Bible says, brothers and sisters. It says, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they want that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been won? Now, wait a minute. He's quoting from Isaiah 53. He's, he's Isaiah saying, Lord, who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Meaning that throughout Isaiah's ministry, as Isaiah was speaking to the people, he's looking around, he's asking the question, who hath believed anything we said? In other words, Isaiah was not seeing the fruit of, of the labor that he was bringing forth or giving forth to the people of God. And he did not see a response to the message. And he's wondering, has anyone believed this? Who has believed our report? And it's like, wait a minute, to whom have the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then he says again in verse 40 now, well, verse 39, therefore, they could not believe because that his eyes said again, he hath what? Blinded. Blinded their eyes. He hath what? That they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts and be what? And I should? The reason why they could not hear and the reason why they could not see is because they had determined that they would not see and hear lest God should heal them. Because if they acknowledged that they could see, then they would have to acknowledge that they were in a lost condition. This is why when Jesus says, show me a penny, whose superscription is on it? They said, Lord, uh, 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 what was the question they asked Jesus? Um, no, 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 not, 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 uh, he said, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's in the same scenario of paying tribute where he says the baptism of John. There it is. The baptism of John. Was it of God or of men? They said, we cannot tell. Why? They said, because if we say that it is of John, he will say, well, why didn't you believe me? If we say that it is of men, the people will stone us. Because not us. They hold John as a prophet. They believe in the spirit of prophecy. We don't. So... We'll come together and say, we can't tell. We can't tell. Well, he says, guess what? Neither tell I you by whose authority I do these things. So the reality of it is, is not that they could not see. They saw. We are told in Desire of Ages that when the man by the pool of Bethesda was carrying his bed through the city, and when they asked him, why carry your bed? And when he began to talk, and when they said, who healed thee? They said, she said that they knew that only one man was capable of doing Amen. what he said. They, they knew that only one man, but they needed a confession so that they could condemn him before the Sanhedrin. So they knew who Jesus was. They knew his work. They saw his work. They saw people being raised from the dead, but they had determined that they are not going to give in to it because should we believe in this message and these methods, then what would that do for our institutions? I can't say that that, that, that message is of God because then that would, and that would be a slap in the face to all my pastors that graduate from the seminary. So I have to pretend as though I don't know what they're talking about. I'm not going to countenance that for fear that someone else sitting in the pew get the bright idea that God can use them without going to our schools. And so Jesus says, this is why they can't hear. Because they would recognize their condition and I would heal them and Satan doesn't want them to be healed. God is our father. No, he isn't. The devil is your father. Because it is his works that you are doing. But then it goes on, brothers and sisters. It says, verse 41, These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, verse 42, among the chief rulers also 
Many did what? Many did believe. Now remember, before this, they said, have any of the rulers believed on him? Here it says, many of them did what? That man that was speaking had no idea how many of his brethren sat around, been going over there watching live stream. <laughs> now, in their day, it wasn't live stream. But they were tiptoeing over there listening to Jesus. They had no idea that Nicodemus had snuck over there by night and was sitting down listening to him. He had no idea. That man that was speaking on that day had no idea how many of his pastors were over there watching and reading truth. Amen. Had no idea, brothers and sisters. Coming and saying, you know what? Please don't compromise me to the people I work for, but we believe what you're saying. We're watching what you're doing. And we know that our pastors are not going to talk about this, but I need to let you know what's coming down the pike here. And brothers and sisters, this is what's happening today. Don't think that just because you're hearing all this out, this, 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 it always said it's the silent majority. Amen. It is always the, 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 the minority that speaks the loudest. And so don't get, get, get distracted by all this noise coming from a small little group. But there's a, there's a lot of people, brothers and sisters, listening to the message. There's a lot of them listening and saying, wow, you know what? And they're even getting it and then going and preaching at other places. But praise God, let the Lord be praised. Amen. And so here it says, it says, nevertheless, verse 42, nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him, but because of what? The Pharisees. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should want. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. This is why they consented and they rejected the message. This was the invitation. God was giving them the invitation to come and to follow him. Just like when the, the, uh, the rich young ruler when the rich young ruler came. Now remember, think about it. What did he say? Have any of the rulers and the Pharisees believed on him? And here the rich young ruler comes and say, Lord, what must I want do to have eternal life? Now, brothers and sisters, consider this, that this rich young ruler is so burdened with his life of guilt and sin. This Oh, that's Mariah. Somebody. This person, this ruler, is so, has, 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 feels so destitute of the love of God. He is in such a condition that he ignores his position and he blurts out publicly, what must I do to be saved? You must understand the desperation of him in order to say that. Because he knew that to accept Christ publicly would get him put out of the ministry. He would not be invited to the board meetings anymore. He would not be allowed to participate in church services anymore. And they would conveniently vote him out the next term. He knew this. But his heart broke so bad. He saw the love of God being demonstrated in Jesus. He saw how Christ handled those children as they came and sat. He saw the promises that he gave those children and those mothers. And he watched people walk away from Jesus who were burdened. But now they were relieved and they were joyful in God. And here he was, a ruler in the temple. And yet he was not sure that he was one with God. He wasn't sure of his salvation. He had believed that salvation comes through his outward works. He believed that salvation come. If I could just find myself in this setting, and if I could just do this, then at some point I would get the assurance to know that I'm right with God. And I'm watching people around me perish. I'm watching people lose their lives. And I'm saying, Lord, please don't let me die. Why? Because I'm afraid to stand in the judgment. These were the fears that this ruler had that led him to the point where he would blurt out, Lord, I, what can I do to be saved? 
Can you imagine the looks that came? The embarrassedness that all of his other peers probably felt? Like, what must I do to be saved? Sometimes parents can get embarrassed when their children almost cry out for salvation. It's almost as though they take it as though it's a slight upon the family. That you had to go over there and get baptized. And this is, I'm sure, how they felt. But the reality is, he was burdened. And nothing that he was doing in his church was doing anything for him. And Jesus longed to give him what he wanted. But Jesus knew, brothers and sisters, as he knows with us, ex unless we are willing to sell what we have, unless we are willing to step away from the world, unless we're willing to allow God to change our motives and our aspirations, we will not be happy with what he's offering us. He knows it. He sees it. And so we're standing there almost as though is that, that God has not given us the thing we're asking for. Lord, I'm praying. But God is saying, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to be happy. Because it's a cross. It's a cross. The world is not going to accept you. The pleasures of sin, they only last for a season. And what, I'm ask, what I want to give you is peace that pass up all understanding. You want to be saved this way. You want God to work, but you want him to work this way. You have already prescribed how you want to get to heaven. You just want to just preach the second coming of Jesus, announce the Sunday law, and then Jesus busts the skies the next day. I mean, you want to be the, the CEO and the founder of your ministry. And yes, look, the Lord is coming. Yes, I'm going to retreat into my thousand acre country land and wait for the coming of the Lord. No, it's not going to happen like that. No, there's a cross that we have to bear. And some don't want to be saved in God's way. We don't want to come to the point of saying, Lord, I can't do it. Nothing to the cross I bring. I don't bring anything, but Lord, it's thy cross that I'm clinging. And I've learned to see light in your light. Here I am, Lord, take me. This is where God is bringing us because God is going to grant us peace, brothers and sisters, that pass of all understanding. People are going to wonder, how on earth can you be happy seeing all this taking place? Because Jesus is my peace. I have these things, but that's not where my peace comes from. My peace comes from Christ. This is what God is longing to give. But brothers and sisters, we cannot impart this to others if we ourselves have not experienced it. Have we accepted the invitation or are we making consent to reject it for one thing or the other? One said, I've, I've gotten a piece of land. I cannot come. One said, I'm married. My family situation is prohibiting me from doing what God is asking. I've bought a piece of land. I've, I've invested in something. I have too much invested in order to give it all to God. And this is why many people are losing out on the joy of salvation. It's a rejected invitation. It's still being rejected. Have we rejected God's entreaties to come into our closets this week? He comes and he knocks and he says, hey, spend time. It's prayer time. It's time to commune. It's time to pray. You need strength. You have no idea what you're about to face. And I'm not talking about some big thing. It's, it's, it's the small foxes we heard this morning. That's destroying the vine. The rejected invitation, brothers and sisters.